So I just want to introduce our next uh, program, which is going to be our Myers-Briggs type indicator. Um, going to be moving around a little bit, and this is going to be headlined by uh, Petro uh, Vega Beer, Be Beers. Sorry. Um, and she is the Officer of Career and Intern Internship Services at SUNY Orange. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting um, her up in SUNY Albany when we were um, meeting all the 64 SUNY presidents, and um, she went, kind of went through this program, and I enjoyed it myself, so hopefully you guys um, will enjoy it and get something from it um, as well, and we'll move around, um, and without further ado, the floor okay, is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for inviting me to be here to speak to you today about the MBTI. Uh, before we get started, can I just see by the show of hands how many of you might have already taken the Myers-Briggs type indicator? Okay, so a fair number. Uh, you're already familiar to some extent then. Have you actually verified your type? Those of you that have taken it or you've just taken it kind of out of fun but never really done the work to verify it? Okay, all right. Very good then, then hopefully you'll be able to learn something today. So um, in, at my college, we use the MBTI to help students with the career decision-making process. We also use it with leadership development. And with our staff and faculty, we have used it for team building purposes. So it can be used for all, all those things. It is an instrument that's widely recognized across the world and used all over. Uh, so it's not, not just here in the U.S., but they use it everywhere for those purposes that I just mentioned. Okay, I think I just skipped one. So the objectives for today's session is that at the end of the training, I hope that you'll all get a better understanding of your particular personality type. We are going to complete a self-estimate of your personality type. So we're going to be moving around and we're going to be doing some interactive exercises. That's why the tables have numbers on them and you'll see how that all works in a little bit. We're also going to learn about the different leadership styles that may be particular to the different personality types and how these personality types impact leadership style. So those are the kinds of things that I hope you're going to walk away with after the presentation this morning. So the MBTI is not a test. It's an indicator. It's an assessment. It is not a test. And it only looks at normal behavior. So it does not look at deviant behavior. It looks at normal behavior. And to start with, I need you to know that there's no better or worse type. All types have their potential strengths and pitfalls and um, weaknesses. Give you an idea, at one point I was um, at, at the school where I work, we had a new manager come in and she decided it was a good idea for all of us to take the MBTI. There was quite a bit of resistance on part of the staff to have to take this and then to discuss it. But what was most interesting after we were all done with this and um, it was her turn to reveal what her type was, she was rather taken aback because apparently she had in her mind that she was a certain type. And then when the test results came back, she didn't like what that uh, assessment said about her. But again, there are no better or worse types. She just didn't like the type that she thought she, she she thought she was. <laughs> Didn't work out that way. So you might know that the MBTI is um, based on Carl Jung's theory of psychological traits. He's a psych um, psychiatrist, Swiss psychiatrist, and Catherine Briggs studied with him, and actually she and her daughter are the ones that came up with the instrument. Using the personality types, they, they made it into an instrument uh, that we now call the Myers-Briggs type indicator. So my, uh, he believed, Young believed, that we have certain preferences that are innate and that these are inborn preferences. So when a child is born, he believed that there are these innate preferences that, um, we, that show up as we go through life and as we behave and make certain decisions and things like that. But he also recognized the fact that some of those inborn preferences could be shaped by environmental factors, such as the family that you grow up in, um, 
the education that you might receive, and the culture that um, you're growing up in. And so he recognized that those could influence the actual natural personality type that we're born with. For example, think of a child that's born, uh, that's whose natural inclination is to be gregarious, outgoing, and um, fearless. And that child grows up in a household with parents who are reserved, quiet, what's gonna happen? They're gonna, refer, res, uh, they're going to re reward certain behaviors, they're gonna reinforce certain behaviors, and the child, in order to survive in that family, is gonna adapt accordingly and suppress some of those natural inclinations and natural ways of being and take on a role in order to survive in that family or in a culture or in an environment. So whenever you take the MBTI, if you were to take it, you want to make sure that you take it in a situation when you are relaxed and when you can th um, be your natural self and not worry about other th things that may influence that, okay? So these inborn press preferences, what he's talking about, he's talking about how people live their life, how they take in information, how they make decisions, and ultimately how they interact with the world around them. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about these uh, preferences. Oops. So this here shows you the instrument, the preferences, which are on two pairs of opposites called dichotomies, okay? So you have the extroversion-introversion uh, pair of opposites, which refers to the way how people like to live their life. And we'll discuss that in a little detail in a, in a bit. He's talking about the sensing intuitive function, which re refers to the way that people take in information. Thinking feeling refers to the way that pe how people make decisions, how you arrive at decisions. And judging and perceiving really refers to the way how we interact with the world uh, at large. What I want you to understand, if you were to take the assessment, and there's a lot of misunderstanding um, about this, when you take the assessment, you might get a score of 30 on I, or you might get a score of five on I. What you need to know is that you are not, 30 doesn't mean that you're more introverted than somebody who scored a five. All the score refers to is the clarity with which you reported your type. Once you've established that you're an I and you verify that by doing exercises such as we're doing today, then you're an I, okay? And generally, um, people tend to be the same type throughout their life. People don't change their type once it's verified. You might learn to um, be able to flex to the other side. So an I might need to adapt to some, uh, to be extroverted at times, but their natural inclination is to be an I, okay? And we'll take a closer look at that. So in order to drive that point home, what I'd like you to do is if you could take a piece of paper and just sign your name. And now if you could, can you please take the pen or pencil and put it in the other hand and sign your name? Okay, so can we hear from somebody how that went? How did it go when you signed with their less preferred hand? Awkward. At hand. The same is true for preferences. You're more comfortable using the preference that you are, that is innate to you, that you're, that's natural for you, but you can flex to the other side and you can use the other side of the, the preferences. It just be, it's just more difficult. You have to think more deliberately about it. 
chances are, as we get older and as we experience things and as we have to flex more to the other side, it becomes easier. Okay, So that's one thing to remember. As you start using the less preferred uh, side of the spectrum there, it does become easier. So this is the type table. And you could see, and I'm going to just pop this up. You could see, can you hear me? All right. You can see that there's 16 types, and that's based on the four pairs of opposites. Okay, and again, not one type is better than another. All these types have their strengths and their weaknesses. Not one type makes a better leader than another. Okay, you will find leaders in all all these different types. However, how the leader performs and how the leader behaves might vary based on their personality type. But all types can be leaders. Okay. So why might we want to understand what type we are? Well, by understanding what type we are, we can maximize our strengths. We can start developing the side of our personality that's less defined and that's less natural. We can start working on that. We can actually seek out opportunities to develop that side. And we can start to understand other people better. We can understand maybe their motivations better and be more empathetic with what, what, what's going on with them. Um, helps us develop to be more tolerant of others' differences but it doesn't tell us whether you're going to be a good leader or not, OK? So what we want to do is look at the first set of opposites. And this has to do extroversion, introversion. And what you want to keep in mind when we're talking about the Myers-Briggs is the definition that you are usually used to when you think about extroversion, introversion. Forget about that, OK? We don't want to use that definition. The definition we're looking at is how you focus your attention and energy, how you arrive your attention and energy. And it's different whether you're on the E side of the spectrum on the, or the I side. So extroverts tend to focus on the outside world. Okay. They enjoy being around other people, events, actions, and things. Eyes, on the other hand, like to focus on the internal world and they arrive their energy through thoughts, emotions, and experiences. So a conference such as this for E's is probably, not that it's not for I's also, they would all enjoy the experience. But at the end of the day, after the conference is done, and maybe it's time to go for dinner, who do you think is really going to be into this? The E's or the I's going out to dinner and chatting with the rest of the group. Generally, the E's, they're going to be energized by the prospect of now I get to go out to dinner and I get to talk to my colleagues about this and I get to uh, brainstorm of what we just experienced. The eyes, on the other hand, well, they might want to go back to the room first and just debrief a little bit and think for themselves about uh, what they just got out of the workshop. And then maybe they'll go meet up with a small group of friends to talk about the experience, OK? So they're both certainly enjoying, I'm sure, the conference. But at the end of the day, how they might uh, proceed would be different based on the personality type. Or what would energize them would be different. For an I to have to then socialize could probably be very draining, whereas an E would probably be really into this, OK? So E's do like to be surrounded by lots of people. They like parties. They like uh, being with other folks. They like networking events. They really enjoy being out there and, ha and, and talking to folks and partying. <laughs> Eyes, on the other hand, they do like people. It's not that they're you know, closed off and don't want to see anybody. They do enjoy people, but in a much smaller, with a much smaller group of close, intimate friends. I like to work out ideas by thinking them through. 
So when there's a challenge, when there's a problem be to be solved, the natural inclination for an I is to probably go to their room, take out a piece of paper, and start jotting down possible solutions. Whereas E's really work out ideas by talking them through. They might get into a brainstorming session and just start talking and throwing out ideas and working the problem through in that way. So very different ways of, uh, of dealing with the situation of being. Again, E's are energized by interacting with others. They're sociable and expressive. They prefer to communicate face to face and they like to talk things through. Eyes are energized by the opportunity to reflect. They're much more private and contained, are much more reserved. They prefer to communicate in writing. I always think that when they invented the uh, internet and email, that that was probably a godsend for all those amongst us who are eyes. <laughs> uh, so we no longer have to go and, and, and chat with people, we can just send an email. And they like to work out their ideas by, by thinking them through. The other difference is that E's really like to get involved in many things. They have an interest in many things. I's have fewer interests, but they delve much deeper into those interests. They get much more involved in those interests. So an E might be all over the place, and I is much more focused on a few interests. E's learn best through doing, I's best through reflecting. Uh, and E's like to take initiative in work and relationships, which I's will also do, but only really if the situation is important to them. That's when you get the I's to be uh, motivated to take initiative. So let's say we're, take, we're taking a look into um, a room where there's a meeting going on. What do you think you might be observing uh, in terms of behaviors on the E side and the I side. What might be a telltale sign who's an E and who's an I, if you were to observe a before the meeting got started, let's say? What would, might, might be happening in the room before the meeting actually started? Okay. Yes, did, did you have a? Yes, that's what we would expect, that the E's would be chatting with each other. They would rather be probably on the louder side. The I's would be much more quiet, maybe chatting with the person next to them, perhaps checking their emails, those kinds of things. That's what we would expect to see when we were to observe a room of, filled with E's and I's. So what I want you to do, based on the discussion we just had and the slide that we just looked at, you probably have an idea of where you fit, whether it's you're an E or an I, right? So you see the tables in the room. They're set up in rows. So that's row two. These people in the first row there have the number two, the second row, number one, et cetera, okay? So all the E's, if you could please find a spot at a table that has the sign one on it. And the row goes this way. So this would be a one, two. Anybody that's an I, please go to a row that's two, okay? So E's are in the table one and I's are on table two. Okay, ones are our E's and twos are the I's. Six to eight people at a table. Okay, so if everybody's situated, this is what I'd like you to do. Okay, for the E's, for the E's who are at table one, what I want you to brainstorm in your session is what makes an extrovert a good leader and what are some of the advantages or disadvantages of working with an extrovert. If you, if you have a note taker, that'd be great because I'd like you to report out at the end. And then the you, people who are on table two are the I's, and I want you to talk about what makes an I a good leader, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of working with an I.
So take about five minutes and do some brainstorming. Okay, time's up. All right. Uh, if we could, let's see if I can cancel us. If we could hear from uh, one of the tables, that, one of the e tables, please, what it is that you discovered as you were talking about that. What do you think makes an extrovert a good leader? Can we hear from some of the e's, one of the e tables? Oh, there's lots of E. <laughs> what makes an E a good leader? Okay. And um, to participate um, and you know, we're not as afraid of sticking ourselves out there, risk taking. Um, and we're willing to communicate with others and ask maybe what they think as well. Okay. I think, I, are you guys an E table as well? I think it's just us. Where are all my E's? Oh, there's some of <laughs> Let's hear from you folks. What, what did you come up with? What makes an E a good leader? Um, in addition to being able to collaborate, um, we feel like we're more welcoming and receptive to different types of ideas. We, we engage the audience to get views from all over. Um, we also think that uh, we're better at working in, in groups, so that also increases communication. Okay. Anything else to say? All right. So before we talk about what that, let's hear from the eyes. What makes an eye a good leader? And the eyes might be less willing to talk, but <laughs> we have a brave soul, so let's hear. <laughs> okay. Um, so we said that we think that eyes are good leaders because we're thoughtful. Um, we're good at planning. Uh, we have a good introspection of how our actions and our thoughts affect other people. And we give a kind of personalized touch because we like the one-on-one -on -one experience. Okay, great. Very good. Anybody else on an eye that has something to add to that? I think as eyes, well, ooh, that's loud. Um, we tend to be great listeners, so that that encourages other people that we work with to kind of share their thoughts and feelings with us, and then it, you know, they they feel more inclined to speak out because they know we're listening, and then at the same time, when we do speak, people tend to kind of listen more because we're saying less. Because it's, it's 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 thought, you know, and processed. Okay, very good. Any <laughs> anybody else want to add to that? The eyes were going to say something. Oh. But they said that table said it, so they didn't want to oh. say it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's right. Listening is important. Yeah. So our our point was basically what um, Jonathan was saying. Um, we feel that eyes are pretty good at taking into consideration and listening and kind of um, really. Uh, um, hearing out and like kind of letting it settle in everyone's ideas and then kind of being able to take everyone's individual ideas and being able to point okay, the good. group in a direction. Yeah. So I think you hear that there's definitely strengths on both sides, on the E side as well as the I side. Uh, in terms of disadvantages in working with an E, were you guys able, were the E's able to think of those? What might that be? What might be some of the disadvantages of working with an E? So one of our big things, I think, is um, we tend to be maybe perfectionists. And in doing so, we maybe sometimes have issues with um, delegating or relinquishing some slight control because we want things to be done a certain way, pretty much, more or less. OK, because you think you know it better than the rest of the team? Um, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Because we're more, I think, forward and vocal. So you think that you know. We're kind of like. Domineering situations. Right. Yeah. Okay. Domineering situations. Yeah, you could come across that way, right? You might be mistaken as being more domineering and controlling and things like that. What about on the eye side? Are there what the eyes? Any disadvantages that you think? Might I? Um, we talked about how sometimes our um, reservation and taking time to think could be interpreted as. Um, disinterest mm -hmm. or um, ambivalence when really we're just kind of taking time to 
analyze, right. but generally it's a bit quieter. Very good. Yeah. Those are definitely some ways that we might be looking at E's and I's. That many times E's and I's could be misunderstood, right? Because we're not in their shoes, we're not seeing it the way they're seeing it. And so somebody that's an E, we might think of them as loud and obnoxious and brazen. And somebody that's an I, we might think of as standoffish and snooty and not interested, right? So, but I think it's, if you hear what we're doing here, it's, it's because of the way that you um, experience the world, whether you're an E or an I, and it doesn't necessarily mean those other things. And the important thing is that you have to learn to be able to really operate on both sides of the coin here, because as you heard, there's strengths in all of those areas, right? I gotta tell you, when I was younger, if you had told me that I would be standing in front of a group like this to talk about something, I would have said, you're crazy. Because I'm a true I, and for me to be able to do something like this back then, would have, I would have never done it. But, remember what I said earlier, we learn through experience and just to, through living and taking on challenges that we do learn to flex to the other side and we do learn to be able to take on some of those other traits as well. So, you know, if you're, for my fellow eyes, if you're really in that shoe where you're reserved and you're, um, you know, not able to share yourself and things like that with experience and with exposure, that all becomes um, easier and you're going to be able to start flexing to the other side. And the, true is, the same is true for the ease. So bottom line is it's important to be able to, to engage in both sides of the spectrum here, right? Anybody have any final thoughts before we move on to the next area? Yes. Um, I'm so happy you said that statement because I feel like I was a question mark. That's why I felt comfortable having the eyes and well, the E's and the eyes here because I always thought I was an extrovert, but then the PowerPoint had me confused, so I stayed with the eyes. <laughs> okay, and wh where do you see yourself fitting so in now? now I'm happy that you said that you can be both. So I think I'm an E or I come off as an E, but I've slow, I'm slowly becoming an I. Like, I'm learning to be an I. <laughs> oh, you're ready to be an I. <laughs> well, sometimes we think that one type is better than the other, too, you know, and we, we, we feel compelled to be that way. But maybe it might not be our natural self. But again, there's no right or wrong. As you heard, there's strengths on both sides. Um, I, uh, I actually don't think that there's... Um, mutual exclusion between being outgoing and being introverted because uh, there are certain people who just, they, they're able to go out there and talk to people and like Dr. Riley said, uh, President Obama, he could just turn mm -hmm. it on and he's one of the most socially adept people out there, mm -hmm. but he's a true introvert. Um, so I think it, it's more of a matter of where you derive your energy, right? And I think that that should be where we're sort of steering this conversation between extroversion and introversion. Mm -hmm. um, rather than being outgoing or not. or not. Right. Which is actually the definition, like you uh, correctly picked up, because the definition is not whether you are extroverted or introverted in the traditional sense, right? It's how, where you arrive your energy. And again, um, we don't know what President Obama was like when he was 10 or 12, right? He might have developed a skill set over the years. And so the good news is we all can, right? And that's uh, what I hope you walk away with from this particular discussion. So when we look at the next uh, set of, oops, this is the next uh, set of opposites. And this has to do with how we take in information, okay? Whether you, we use our senses to take in information or intuition. So sensing folks are generally people that focus on the present, on what's happening in the here and now current events and facts, what is actual, what is practical, what is real. Intuitives focus on the future. They look at opportunities, new opportunities, and they look at ideas. They're very much future focused, future oriented. So sensing, again, they use their senses to take in information. What they see, what they hear matters to them. They're very good in picking up details. So they really notice the details um, of things. And they tend to be 
practical. Intuitives on the other side, they li listen more to their subconscious, to their hunches. They might arrive at uh, conclusions based on a hunch rather than on um, the actual facts. They are good at seeing the perspective, the, the big picture. The S's tend to focus more on the details, whereas the intuitives tend to focus more on the, on the whole and on the big picture. So when you hear the saying, uh, you can't see the forest for the trees, I would argue that the S's are focusing on the trees within the forest, and the N's focus on the bigger picture. They focus on the forest rather than the, in the individual trees. So N's prefer to do what is innovative. And again, I don't want those of you who are S's to think that you're not able to think innovatively. That's not at all what we're saying. It's just one side is a preference over the other. Both sides can flex either way. So S's focus on the real and on what's actual. And N's focus more on patterns and meanings. I'll give you an example. I went to a, an art show with my son. And as we're walking through, we, we admired this a picture. And we're walking away from the picture, and we're talking about the picture. And he's telling things to me that he saw in this picture I didn't. I had to take a walk back to look at this picture to see if these things really were there. And indeed, they were. He's an S. He picked up on that stuff. Whereas I'm an intuitive. I looked at the picture, and I saw the picture as a whole. I didn't pick up on the individual details. So that's just a, an example. They, the S's observe and remember specifics. And N's tend to remember specifics as they relate to patterns. S's tend to be more fa factual, concrete, and se sequential. And N's are more abstract and imaginative. S's are much more careful to build towards a conclusion. N's, because of their hunches, they go much quicker. They, they come up with a uh, solution much quicker and follow their hunch. S's understand ideas and theories through practical applications. And N's generate ideas and theories Application is really secondary. One group is specific and literal. The other is more comfortable with, with metaphors and analogies. S's trust their experience, and N's tend to trust their insights. So given that description, if you were a police officer and you came onto an accident, who do you think, based on the description that we just looked at, would be a more reliable witness? Everybody pretty much agree that it's the S's? Yeah, because they've picked, they paid attention and they really watched the details unfold, whereas the N's might have not really focused in on the actual details. So that would be uh, correct. And N's tend to make, make inferences much more readily than the S's do. I think you could see by looking at S's and N's how, when it comes to career decision, this particular dichotomy might be a, a real indicator in terms of what career might be a good match for somebody. So you folks are pretty much all in the STEM careers. So the STEMs, where do you think they would fall more, on the S or the N side? S. Especially if we compare it to somebody that's studying, um, I don't know, English literature or something like that, right? We would expect those people to fall more on the N side. But again, both sides can flex either way. You're just more comfortable one way or the other. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to put a picture up. Um, well, first, I need you to move into groups. So any questions about that? Do you have somewhat of an understanding whether you're an S or an I, uh, an S or an N? Yeah, how, how flexible are these two as opposed Because E and I, it seemed it was more, so I guess, simple to like yeah, it's a flexible skills or something right. like that. And this, it seems... Yeah, this is a little more difficult. More like, it seems more concrete in terms of whatever you are, you are, and then you're not as able to flex. But like, in personal experience, I would argue that you could... You could go easier. both ways? This is easier to flex than how to be an eye. Oh, to flex, yes. Yeah. But it's... This can be learned more. more. The skill can be learned better. Yeah, but yeah. Like kind of the example just seems a little more concrete. So. Okay. Do you see where you fall on it? Uh, 
You don't <laughs> really have an idea of. This one's difficult, yeah. I, I agree entirely. I think that has a lot of, I mean, we're all future health, oh. we're all future healthcare providers, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like after a certain point through all of your experiences and whatnot, you start to develop intuition as to what the diagnosis might be. You Correct. see a constellation of symptoms and it's just, you don't really have to think about it. You just know when you see it. Right. That's what I, that's the, that, that's the gist that I get when I talk to older doctors. So mm -hmm. I don't, this, this distinction doesn't seem very concrete at all. Uh, but I think you just made that point as with experience and as you get older and as you've been around the block a number of times, you're intuitively realize more of what might be going on than when you're first learning, right? When we're first learning, we're more specializing than, we're, than being a generalist. As you gain more experience and as you practice more, your tuition, you might go more with your hunches and with your intuition rather than when you're first starting out. When you're first starting out, you said it. You, it's much more concrete and much more specific. That's what you're relying on because you have, don't have that world of experience yet. So and that, that's accurate. Yeah, I can add to that, uh, particularly for, for uh, cl clinical types in the room. Um, you're right. We, we, we have this diagnostic hunch. Mm -hmm. But one of, the, one of the things that will lead you to make a mistake is what we call anchoring bias. Say, so, oh, yeah, I've seen a patient with right lower quadrant pain. I've seen this 40 times. This is X. And you anchor to that. And next thing you know, it ain't X. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can, you know, miss a signal. You can miss another diagnosis because of that anchoring bias. Okay. So that's why even we tell the young clinicians, yeah, it's pattern recognition. But don't be so beholden to the pattern recognition that you don't at some point say, well, wait a second. Okay, this looks like it could be, but could it be another thing? Mm -hmm. So again, that's, you know, in terms of clinical skills, you're right, it's, you know, how many times do I see right lower quadrant pain, I know, you know, but it only takes two or three mm, of, of not being consistent with your diagnosis to really humble you right. as a clinician. So then you still want to fall back on that sensing and looking at the details and all of that, great. So if we could please have all the, um, everybody that thinks there and S if you could go to the table once, and everybody that thinks they're an um, intuitive, go to table twos. So S's will go to one, and intuitives to two. So S's are at one, and N's are at two, right? I'm going to put a picture up on the screen, and I want you to take a few minutes to look at the picture, and then Discuss what it is that you saw, okay? So I'm going to display the picture for about 30 seconds. And then I want you to discuss in your groups what it is that you saw. Just observe the picture. Now, if you could, in your groups, please, just take a few minutes and discuss what it is that you saw. What is it that you saw? OK. All right. So just curious to hear what you folks notice when you watch the picture. So we have uh, intuitives at two, right? You want to share with us what you saw? Well, I was noticing. This is kind of a detail, so. But on the back wall, there were like marionettes hanging and they had a string and then like a circle at the end of the string. And I was noticing that those circles all had the colors of like the Olympic logo, like the rings. Okay. So I was like, is there a meaning there? Is there like, what is that about? Can you elaborate on that? I, so I guess I thought it was like, maybe shows more of an intuitive trait of like, it's not just about noticing the colors or the particular animals that the puppets were, but I wanted to see, like, what is the meaning behind these colors and these rings? Is it some kind of message? And did you make up a story about it? Well, just that maybe it has to do with the Olympics, which it oh. probably doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Somebody else on the, uh, this was N. Any other intuitives? Intuitives? Oh, okay, so we did kind of sort of see a story in it, just the 
the borders had the rhyme Jack Nimble, Jack Quick, Jack Over the Flame. And then like the puppets he was holding looked like Jack was like going over a flame. And then the girl behind him was sort of like closing her eyes to kind of tell him not to do what he was doing. I don't know. It just seemed something like that. And then um, he like his shirt was pretty cool. He had sort of like a landscape with like um, sheep. It was a sheep or like farm animals or something in a meadow or okay. something like that. I'm not sure. It was a lot. Yeah, like with the no details, just a story. <laughs> you're like, but yeah, that's kind of okay. The story but we what saw. you're reporting on is, is what you saw. You saw a shirt with some pictures on it, correct? Is that an N or an I tray? An N or an S? It's really, an, are you really reporting back out on what it is that you actually saw, right? Mm -hmm. And are there any other people here that thinks they're, they're an N, an intuitive? So um, we've noticed a few things as well. Uh, one thing that was noticed was there was uh, like a mouse or a rat coming out of one of his sleeves. Um, wow. Also, they were hanging butterflies and ladybugs in the uh, background scene and around on the frame where it said, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick. When it said Jack be nimble, it was spelled B-E, but the Jack be quick actually had a picture of an actual B. Okay, very good. All right, I would argue that those are all S, S reports. I, I think, I think that <laughs> knowing that we've clearly discussed the difference between an S trait and an N trait now Identifying with somebody that's more intuitive, having this discussion makes me more inclined to focus on the details. Okay. But if this picture was shown prior to, I honestly don't think I would have been as focused on the details. On the details, okay. And what we find is that if you have intuitives, or let's say you have sensing, look at the picture. Initially, they're going to pick up on all those details that all of you just mentioned. And eventually, if you give it more time and they have more time to look at the picture, they're going to start coming up with a story on the intuitive side and vice versa. So intuitives might make up by looking at the whole picture. They make, might make up a story about it. But eventually, they're going to come down to listing all those things that they actually saw. Okay. So again, both sides flexing to both traits flexing to both, both sides. We have somebody else? Where does it, what, what personality type does it fall in? I mean, this is how you think of medicine, but also how I think is like, you start making a story, and then you look at another detail, and you see if it fits into the story, and then you edit your story, and then you look at another detail, and okay. you edit your story. What is, where does that way of thinking kind of fit into this? Is that a, is that a sensing or an intuition? I think it's using both, right? Yeah. You're looking at the details, which would be on the sensing side, and then you make it part of the, the greater picture. So I think it's being so able to do both. constantly updating the story. You're right. Not starting with a story and then filling it and in. And adding to and it. And then you're not starting with details yes. at creating a story. I would think it's both, that you would need to yeah. both. Now, let me tell you, if we had a true, did you have something to add? I did. Yeah. Uh, I guess I, I want, what I wanted to say was that I guess I'm confused on the distinction because I thought of myself as uh, a sensor because I'd spent all day crunching data and running like statistical analyses. Okay. Um, but evidently, I, according to my table, uh, <laughs> I am more intuitive. But I looked at the picture and I saw discrete details first. I looked for those details. And then after gathering those details, I thought, well, what does that mean? Right. And so I wonder what is the distinction because I feel as though people do both. Right. It's, it's what you would be inclined to do first, what the thing that you jump to first as your fallback. And that for you was the sensing. And then eventually you get to the intuitive piece. But is that also context dependent? Uh, and so I wonder like. Situational, yeah. yes. And so like, how can one like definitively say, you are this type, it, I think it has to be contextualized. In this setting, you do this thing. But in this setting, you do another yeah. thing. And therefore, how can you be one Actually, versus very, the other? Very good point. And a good leader will be able to do both those things. It's a situational. Uh, if you're looking at the situation and you might need to use sensing or you might need to use intuitive. So a good leader is actually able to do both. Or if they can't, what is it that they want to do? What was that? Build a team. Build a team. Right. If you yourself don't have those strengths, 
that doesn't mean you can't be a good leader. You can still be a good leader. You can um, form a team where you have people that have those strengths. I mean, for myself, being an intuitive, if I had to sit there and crunch data and look at the details, it would drive me nuts. I wouldn't be able to do that. But as a director of an office, I certainly value the people that can do those things. And they are part of my team. And when we do make decisions, both factors count in. But so far, I've really only heard from S's in this room. No true intuitives, which I guess if you're pursuing the STEM careers won't make sense. And there is such a thing as a group type, by the way. When you have a group of people, you can have a group type meaning what the majority of the people in that room lean towards. So I think certainly on this scale, the group type, I would think, would be heavy on the S side. An intuitive, what I saw looking at the picture, I saw a puppeteer manipulating two people in a, a beautiful sunny day, but the, he was in control and he was moving these puppets around. And I didn't pick up on any of that other stuff that was on that picture. Okay, so that. Based on that, anybody think that they might join me on the intuitive side? <laughs> May, okay, you were smiling in the back. Can you comment? Uh, no. It's exactly the same thing. Like the first thing that popped into my head when I saw the picture was the puppeteer, you know, controlling the puppets. I didn't pay attention to like the outside details until afterwards, like after okay, I good. started. Yeah, that's what uh, the intuitives would tend to do, yes. I also noticed that I started on the outside and I read like the frame and then I kind of started focusing my um, thoughts on the inside. So like I gathered all my thoughts as a whole and then I started looking more into detail. Like, okay. like what Trish said, I started focusing more in detail after being aware that I'm more intuitive. Okay, good. Yes, great. Yeah, I also like my attention jumped to like what's the meaning behind this picture versus like what am I really looking at in terms of the detail. So like my mind was already putting a story together. Like, is this like some greater power? Okay. Yes, <laughs> that controlling our lives. Kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, eventually, okay. eventually. <laughs> so individually, if you're an S, would you only? come to one story looking at that picture after gathering the facts versus someone who's intuitive where they might generate multiple storylines from the image? Or does that not matter? I'm not sure. I don't know if it would matter. Or does that just reflect creativity? Yeah, maybe on your experiences, <laughs> yeah. So again, situation specific. OK, great. But I think what I was hoping to drive home here is because we focus on different aspects we might come to different conclusions, right? If you have a situation and if you focus on a different aspect in terms of how you take in the information, you might come to different conclusion. So the bottom line, a good leader can flex to both sides. Or if they're not able to, they'll surround themselves with people that can, right? And that's, again, where we come into that whole diversity, making people, a, a team of people that have different talents. Unfortunately, what happens often is that managers surround themselves with people that are like them. And so you could come up with a group type where most of the people are a particular type. And that would make it very difficult for a team to operate, right? Because the people that are different might feel left out. They might not feel like part of the team. Uh, and on the on the organization's end, if you have people that are all like-minded, you might miss some mistakes that are being made because you're not going to pick up on it if everybody operates the same way. So again, it's important to be able to do both. So that brings us to the third function, which has to do with thinking and feeling. And this is how we make decisions. And this is the one function that is gender-based. Um, I'm sure you can all guess, where do you think the women end up in terms of making decisions? Are they on the feeling or the thinking side? Mostly, mostly. Traditionally, women have been on the feeling side in terms of how decisions are made. Traditionally, women, and might, one might argue maybe it has to do with the whole nature-nurture business, but women, two-thirds of women fall on the feeling side. Okay. Um, what it means, feeling and thinking. Thinking, these are people that make decisions objectively using logic. 
and feeling make, they make decisions subjectively using feelings. Now, I don't want you to think that anybody that, that operates on the thinking end is cold and heartless. And that anybody that's on the feeling side as it is emotional and irrational, because that's not what that means. Okay, what it means is thinking folks make decisions based on logical analysis. They can convince other people in an argument through facts and impersonal arguments. So they will collect a lot of facts and they'll present the facts in order to win people over in an argument. Our feeling types make decisions based on personal values. So personal values do factor into the decision-making process. And they convince others through personal influences, through charisma, charm, et cetera, more so than through um, maybe the facts. So thinkers, in order to make a decision, they tend to step back and look at the situation objectively. People on the feeling side actually step into the situation and identify uh, with the, those involved. Thinkers tend to analyze and feelers tend to empathize with others in order to make decisions. One side uses cause and effect and the other is guided by personal and group values. Thinkers solve problems with logic and feelers tend to look at how the decision might impact other people. T's strive for the objective standard of truth. They love, the F's love harmony and positive interactions. Harmony is very critical to them and uh, keeping things on a positive um, trajectory is important. T's are considered reasonable and F's are considered compassionate. So T's might be labeled tough-minded and F's tender-hearted. T's think of themselves as being fair because they treat everybody the same. They believe in treating, treating people equally. F's, on the other hand, think they're fair, but they want everyone to be treated as an individual. Okay? So it's a whole different way of looking at it. Just to give you an example, when I was doing the Myers-Briggs years ago, um, the little I knew about the test or the assessment, I considered the Fs to be irrational and, um, you know, um, emotional. And so when I took the test, that being in my head, I answered questions like I thought I should answer them so that I would come out on the thinking side. And I did. For years, I came out on the thinking side. And then I took the training for uh, doing the MBTI, and I went through you know, verifying my type. And it finally dawned on me that just because I use feelings to make decisions doesn't mean that I'm an irrational person or that I'm emotional. And that I can still make decisions that make sense. And so I finally fessed up to my true self, which is an F. <laughs> so um, just to give you an idea of how, um, you know, how this works and how you verify your type. So, what we want to do is we have our T's at table one and the F's on table two, please. And then we'll do a quick exercise. T's on table one and F's at table two, right? OK. So I'm going to give you a scenario. And then I want you to troubleshoot the scenario, okay? So you're a team who, you are on a team who's completed a major piece of work for your organization. You have all been working hard on this and you've been presenting, you want to present the results of your study at an all expense paid conference held in the Caribbean. With just three weeks to go, the finance director tells you that the budget has had to be cut and there's only enough money for three of your team members to go. Your job is to decide who in your actual group goes and, and uh, how you decided on that. 
So decide who gets to go and how you decided on that. If you could take about four minutes to discuss that, and then we'll debrief. Who gets to go and why? All right, if we could hear back and see how people uh, dealt with this situation. So I think we had thinkers on the table one, right? And feelers on table two, is that right? All right, so can we hear from uh, some of the uh, thinkers in terms of making decisions? How did you determine who gets to go and why? Anybody? So um, we were talking about uh, how we could be pretty much the most fair. And then the conversation became, do we think of going to the Caribbean and going to this conference as a, um, an obligation or, or a privilege, right? So then pretty much of the people, of all of us who, who want to go, we would opt in. And if anyone else has any other obligations that weekend, they can just you know stay home. And then so of the however many of us who want to go, just pull the names out of a hat. And uh, okay. that's pretty fair. I mean, that's fair. we because we thought it was really arbitrary to try to think who would take who would get the most out of this. You know, who would benefit the most? Who'd be the best networker? Yada yada yada. Everyone thinks they would benefit the most from it. Everyone thinks that they that they did the that, most work. Right, exactly. So, just random chance. Okay, so that's a way to do it to press, pull names out of a hat. And that was under the assumption that we all contributed an equal amount. Okay. If you don't have that assumption, then it makes it a lot easier. If okay. three people did way more work, then it becomes a lot easier to do that. Right. But, so we tried to focus under the assumption that we were all equal. That everybody did the equal amount of work. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other thinkers that had other thoughts on that? Um, oh, yeah, this is a thing table, right? Okay. Um, we kind of came to the decision that the first person who would go would be the person who um, did the most productivity-wise to the project. The second person would kind of be the data cruncher who would be able to like explain why the okay. information is the way that it is. And then the third person would be the person who would be able to tie it all together. Great. And who would be able to convey that to a crowd. So you're looking to make sure that you have the best people presenting at the uh, conference right. so that you look as good as you can. Right. Excellent. Any other thoughts on the thinkers other than what they came up with? If not, can we hear from some of the feelers? How did you make a decision? Well, I mean, I think we, we had some discussion. We had multiple ideas. But a big part of the idea that we had was to like prioritize people who needed the opportunity to go. So people who hadn't been to a conference before or people who, you know, so we were thinking, so we were all talking about, like, would we give up our place? <laughs> and, and that was a lot of discussion about that. But part of what was coming out was like, well, really, who needed the opportunity? Were there, were there like junior people who needed the opportunity more and hadn't been to a conference, and this would be a good opportunity for them? That okay. was part, Very of, nice. part of what we were talking about. So I kind of automatically jumped to, I, I would try to like probably come up with a fundraiser or something to help so everybody goes. OK. Because That's a typical for me, feeler. <laughs> <laughs> response. So for me, my initial thought is that if I'm working collaboratively in a team, everyone is pulling their weight. Otherwise, that's not probably my team. So everybody may be working at their best ability in their role, because we all have different roles. So I don't think it's necessarily easy to say, this person that's chief you know, executive officer or this, um, this manager for this floor, they'll be working at different levels. But okay. if they're going to be working at the best at their ability with their uh, assigned position, it's hard to necessarily say merit when they're different you know, levels within a team. So if I'm within a team dynamic, I'm pretty sure that my team is going to be fulfilling their role to the utmost. So I would make a way so everyone can go and take advantage of the you opportunity. You would look at a way, at a fundraiser yeah. too. Great. Very good. Do you see the distinction here between the T's and the F's? I mean, they both come to a decision, right? But the way they go about what they're doing is, is, is quite different. And it's not to say that one is better than the other. In terms of your leadership, how might a T person be perceived? If we could just take a minute, think about why, how might a, a T person, of the things that you heard, how they make decisions, and the way that an F that makes a decision, how might they be perceived by others? I think it's right there on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> ah, you're cheating. <laughs> yes. That's a, that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> okay, how else might you put it? <laughs> okay. Yes. I think sometimes people that are more thinkers come across as very strict or they're all about the rules, but it's not because they don't, you know, feel for people or right. don't want people to have opportunities, but just that they see, you know, having a logical strategy or having picking names out of a hat as a way that nobody gets an unfair advantage or people that are better at advocating for themselves get more opportunities. It's just like the rules apply to everybody and so that's what's right. fair that's right. to them. We're all treated equally. Okay, very good. Yes. Um, so I just want to put this out there since it hadn't been said yet, but uh, something that I would do would, something that's very important to me is to make sure that like everybody who is involved in a decision has a voice. So to take into account stakeholders' voices. So I don't know, I mean, I feel that this is in the feeling category, but it could be an either, I suppose, that um, I would leave the decision up to everybody so I would you know I would have everybody have a voice in their say and avoid on their peers because I think that's like the most powerful way of making a decision mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense as a leader I think sometimes it's important to diffuse your responsibility um, and in you know there's a difference between equity and equality sure so in this sense it would be more equitable to do okay. it that way I think which might be, oh yes, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, I thought it was interesting how the, there was a couple people on the, on, the, on the thinking side that were like, well, we just have to make sure that everyone did the same amount of work. And like us feelers, we're like, of course everyone did the same amount of work. We're all on the same team, you know, split it up, do a fundraiser. And yeah, that was interesting. Okay. Well, it's a different way of yeah. looking at it, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think there was a dichotomy made that thinking thinkers are more objective and feelers are more subjective. But I think that's a very hard thing to analyze about yourself. I would love to say that I'm very objective and I'm a thinker, and all the other MBTI tests that I indicator tests that I've done say that I'm a thinker. But um, when I come when I think about my experiences and analyze them as a thinker, I realize that I'm not as objective as I am, and it's very hard to be objective about your objectivity. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I, I think, in, in, again, in the leadership role, there's advantages to both sides. Sometimes you have to make those tough decisions, and you have to look at the bottom line, and sometimes you, you want to also consider how it impacts and affects other people uh, within the team. So it's not an easy role, bottom line, as, an, as an, a leader in the end. It's, it's up to you, it's your decision, right, in terms of how you come around to it. And hopefully you'll be considering both sides, how it might impact others, but also how, what is the best for the organization at the time. So that, that one is a really tough one. I'm going to have to fly through the next exercise because we're uh, running towards the end. Do I, can, do I have an extra five, ten minutes? Okay. All right, then we can take a little bit of time. Oh, so perceiving and judging has to do with how we interact with the world, okay? And so forget about the traditional definitions of judging. Uh, in this case, judging really refers to people who act according to a plan. They like to have a plan, they like to know what to expect, and they like things to be pretty consistent. Whereas perceivers, they like to act according to a given situation. They're more flexible, but also more impulsive. So judging, they like a plan. So if you're a judger, you probably have a list of things, and you probably tend to cross off the list as you get things done. That's a typical judging trait. So they're organized and they like to complete tasks, get it off the list, and move on. Right? It's very important. The most important thing to a judger is that if you have a task, you can check it off, it's done, and you can move on. They like structure. Order means a lot to them. 
they can't function if things aren't structured and in order. Perceivers, on the other hand, they like to keep the door open, postpone making decisions. To them, it's not important that this be nailed down and closed and moved on to the next thing. They like all possibilities to be considered and to keep things pretty open in their decision-making process. They don't mind uncertainty and last-minute changes. Now, judges, on the other hand, that would drive them absolutely bananas if you all of a sudden changed course of action, right? Uh, and I can hear from the juggle here that you, you could probably see yourself in one of those situations where it might drive you absolutely nuts. I know it does me. <laughs> I happen to be a judger, and my husband is a perceiver. And that can sometimes become a little bit of a, a problematic. P's that need flexibility, and they like choice, OK? They like things to th remain open. So judges are organized, systematic, they're methodical. They like to make plans. Perceivers are adaptable, more curious, casual, open-ended. And they keep things open, and they're not, change doesn't bother them, last minute changes. Judges like to have things decided. Again, they like to know that it's done and move on. Perceivers like to explore options. Judges resist reopening a decision. Once a decision is made, that's it. No need to revisit, right? Perceivers, on the other hand, that's, that's quite all right with them. They, they, if something else comes along, they're willing to open it up and look at it again. Judges like to avoid last minute stresses. And perceivers are energized by that. Um, so perceivers, procrastination might be something that we might, might say uh, on, the, on that side of the spectrum. And on the judging side, we might say that they, these folks might come to a premature decision because they want to get things closed and move on to the next thing. So they might be in a situation where they might make premature decisions. And on the other side, we're talking about people who procrastinate and things just linger on and on. So I think you can see the positive and negative on both of those sides, right? Um, just think about where you fall. And if I could have all judges with one at the table with the one and all perceivers with the table at the two. <laughs> so if you think you fall into the judging world, you would be one. If you think you fall into the perceiving world, you would be two. <laughs> think about how you would go ahead. Hello. <laughs> think about how you would go about uh, planning a vacation. So you're planning a vacation. What do you do? Take about two minutes. OK. OK. I don't know if our judges had enough time to plan, but if we could just get back together. Hello. Hello. OK. So I don't know. This is a judging table here. I don't know if you guys had enough time to go into all the details that you're going to do. <laughs> so let's hear. What are you guys, how are you going to plan for your vacation? What are we doing? She makes PowerPoints <laughs> for her vacation. So it's very serious for us to like have a list of where we want to go, but maybe what days we want to do it, depending on how big the list is. Some a little flexibility, but mostly like a checklist for sure. Okay. And it's very frustrating going on a vacation <laughs> with people who don't plan. So mm, very good. I would act I would actually like to I'll offer a bit of a different perspective in that I rigidly plan out when the vacations itself overall will occur. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I intentionally actually discard plans on vacation because that's when I'm relaxing. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I would call that planning for flexibility. You plan in your spontaneity. <laughs> planning. Very good. <laughs> OK. Anyone else on the judging side what it is that you do when you plan? 
a few of us also like to plan like times and it gets really frustrating when people are late to things okay. or like are wasting not wasting your time but like you know your time is valuable and like you're going on vacation to this place what are the odds you're going to hit this place right. again you want to hit up like check off all the like cool things because like if you you're not gonna like odds are that you're not coming back right, right? and so when your people are late and like plans get shifted it's yeah. frustrating really frustrating <laughs> for sure Anybody on the perceiving side, how do you plan a vacation? Well, well like, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like if it's a vacation, it should be stress-free. Like, like, you know, I mean, I mean, like, having, like, an idea of what you're going to do when you get there. But All it doesn't right. need to be, like, so systematically planned. Like, you can just kind of, like, figure it out along the way. Figure it out as you go. Okay. What do you guys think? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You don't maximize. But you enjoy, you enjoy it more. Uh, <laughs> if, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we heard from them that that would really be stressful. Really stressful. OK. I, Anybody want to like, add? Anybody want to add to that? Over here. What, are you, what side are you on? I, I, I'm a thinker, oh, apparently. Ju uh, judger. judger. Um, but I think it comes down to what are you trying to get out of this vacation? Are you trying to hit up the most places and, and objectively get the most out of it? Or do you just want to chill? And I mean, I, 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 like make, I like making plans, you know, but there's a time and place for everything. Okay. So on vacation, just kick back and relax. It's okay if you don't hit up every Michelin star restaurant. Okay. You don't have to do that. All right. <laughs> so you're planning to be a little more flexible. Very good. Uh, yeah, I think people who judge tend to have uh, a little bit more of something that's known as FOMO, um, which is the fear of missing out. So they try to plan for things so that they don't leave the vacation and then say, oh, I wish I did that. I wish I did that. Um, maybe. Maybe, right. But how, how do you think, I, I think you heard quite a distinct difference between judges and uh, uh, perceivers, right? How do you think that'll play out in the workplace? What do, you, what do the judges think about perceivers? Do we have any more judges? What do you guys, what do the judges think about perceivers? I think it's the time thing that Prabhani was saying. So it's like if we have a schedule and we have a... So it, going back to the time thing that Robani was saying, if we have a schedule and we have like a deadline and things right. need to get done by a certain time, then respecting each individual's time and schedule because we right, all so have a lot of things that we have on our plate and we organize it a certain way so that we can get them done. Okay. And if uh, perceivers are a little wingy on wingy the timing, that, right. then uh, it affects us. We okay. don't want to wing. Okay. <laughs> we have a bunch of people over there. You don't want to wing. Okay. I'm with you. <laughs> Hi, I'm a judger. Um, <laughs> we won't hold it against you. I, I'm, my name is Trish and I'm a judger and I'm a proud judger. I would just like to say that on vacation we enjoy getting the things done on our list and that's what makes us like happy, happy. on vacation. Okay. So we do have fun. They do have fun. Okay. <laughs> but I good. think that as a judger we probably perceive those perceiving individuals as unreliable. Okay. Yes. Yeah. At the workplace that is sometimes the what comes out. Yes. Um, I also am a judger, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it just hit me in her saying that my mom is a P, so I've been suppressing my judging capacities because I've had to oblige by my mother's last minute ways. I mean, uh, you know, like her free spirited ways. Drives you crazy, right? <laughs> and last minute, always late to everything. So today, I was like the first person here, and I'm like, wow, I'm free. <laughs> You're a judge and you're proud. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay. What about perceivers? What do you guys think on the perceiving side? So. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So I'm a perceiver and my older sister is a judger. So it's very interesting to have that dynamic. And I think a lot of times, like, judges perceive perceivers to be very laser fair, you know, mm -hmm. type B, not taking things seriously. But I think one of our strengths that really comes in is that aspect of feeling energized under pressure. So my sister does a lot of planning. And because I'm so chill, she gets frustrated sometimes. <laughs> and say we get somewhere late or something like that, she gets flustered. She's not sure what to do. And that's where I find my strength. It's like, 
here's what we should do, here's what we can do, here's how it should go, and it ends up being fun. So it's great when they plan, but sometimes plans go awry. And so I think that's mm. where perceivers come in, is that even when the plan isn't there or when the plan doesn't work out, we know how to adapt to the situation and make it as fun as it could be. And you can bounce with it. Very good. So uh, to kind of piggyback on what she said, uh, my wife is uh, probably the most judging person, and I am probably the most perceiving person. And so a lot of these conversations we've played out like on our honeymoons, and, and so I, I actually respect all that she does. She has every single list of everything we can possibly do, eat, right? We, I don't have to make any decisions. So it's like the, <laughs> the most laid back vacation I can go on. Uh, but when things do go awry, she is devastated. Mm. And so, um, I mean, we we're supposed to go to Disney World last week, I mean, last year. And then our daughter, she was sick, and then it, it really crushed her. For me, it was like, oh, we save money, we'll go when they can remember <laughs> these things. And so, so it's, it's one of those things where it's not the end of the world. We went to Sesame Place, and everyone was happy. So, okay, good. So you were able to adapt. I think you hear both sides, and you can see the strength on the both on the both sides. Okay. As a perceiver, I feel like judges, like they were saying over there, judges get really, really upset when their plans go awry. So perceivers are the ones who are damage control. Okay. So they look to us to say, all right, this plan didn't work out, fix it. And if we weren't so okay with last minute changes, I feel like there would be a lot of chaos in the world. Okay. I feel like we balance out. Out the thing, all right. Wait, we have a lot of opinions on this one. <laughs> um, I was just gonna say, there is a line between your personal life and your work life. And in your work life, you need a plan, you need a list. We all work, it, we, we all, are going to probably write a grant at some point. And if you write to the NIH and say, well, I like to explore options and I don't want to make any decisions too soon and I'm <laughs> energized by last minute pressure, you're not going to get that grant. You know, you need a plan, you need plan B's, plan C's, okay. plan D's. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. I think in the work life, a lot of perceivers often have to adapt and have to um, adjust to meet the world of the judges because and in the workplace that's kind of how how it goes right unless um, I mean in a lot of the newer startup companies however allow for a lot of the perceiving type of personality traits to flourish so people you know like Google places like that Facebook the whole in work environment is so different than it was years ago when you think of the traditional outfit like IBM talk about IBM being a true judging kind of company, and then the newer startups being much more on the perceiving side. And I think some of that, by the way, has to do with um, the generations, because we're learning that the younger generations, that there are more people on the P side than there are on the judging side for people like myself who come out of the uh, boomer generation. So there is some stuff going on generationally also. I One think, more and then we have to move on. I'm sorry. I think there's a judging culture. You said in the workplace we have we have to abide by judging standards because we have a judging culture. Right. And I am a judger, so uh, I think I can say this a little bit maybe less biased, that if you look at other cultures and other workplaces, there are some cultures that are less about the protocol and more about doing things at your own pace. Mm -hmm. So um, I come from a culture where being on time is not given a priority. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it's optional. Right. And, it's optional. and a, lot of it, a lot of it comes historically, I think, from this uh, industrial revolution that we've had and how we have to stick to a certain time schedule, this eight to five, nine to five, right. whatever. Um, and maybe this culture has been set up for us, but it doesn't mean that it's the best culture necessarily because I do think that as a judger, I tend to be not as creative because I'm always trying to stick to a plan, but some of the best ideas come when, it, when they're not planned. Some of the best outcomes are happening on the spot due to um, pressure zones. Good. Very good. Thank you. Great discussion, really appreciate it, but we do have to move on, because I know you have another workshop to go to. One thing that your president pointed out, I think in terms of relationships too, can you see how maybe how opposites might attract one another, right? And that is the MBTI actually also has a whole section when you start reading it about relationships and things like that and how 
uh, what types complement each other. So that's kind of a cool thing. So I just want to summarize. Again, I hope I was able to demonstrate that every type really has their strength and things that they need to work on, their blind spots. And that it's critical as you develop your leadership styles that you flex to the other side, that you take on challenges that will take you out of your comfort zone so that you can start acquiring those other uh, skills and become more comfortable with them, with the things that are not natural for you, and develop as a leader so that you can use both sides of the spectrum. Just real quick, uh, leadership styles, a combination of the thinking, feeling preference, judging, perceiving preference is what can tell us a lot about leadership styles. And this here is a graph, and if you look at that, you can see uh, how the US public breaks down into uh, different types. And then you can also see how executives on top management, where they fall, into leadership type. And let me just quickly ask you, here in America, what do you think is the type that, when it comes to thinking, feeling, which type is most attracted to leadership roles? Thinking, is that pretty much? Yes, I would say that that's true. It's the thinking type that generally is attracted to leadership roles. What about on the judging, perceiving side? Yes. It's the TJs that are generally the majority of the executive leadership, uh, which doesn't mean, again, that other types can't lead. It just means that that type is attracted to those opportunities and those types of jobs. And here, this diagram, just to tell you what the numbers mean, uh, if you looked at that more carefully, we would find that 48% of executives are TJs, 23 are TPs, and FJs and FPs are only 13% in terms of the leaders, uh, at the executive level of leadership. Um, and then when it comes to E's and I's, where do you think in America, again, which type is more attracted? E, e yeah, right. Uh, it's the E type. And that breaks down. In the general population, E's and I's are about evenly split. But when it comes to executive level management, E's are at six, around 61% and I's on the 33%. And the other piece that's noteworthy to, to take note of here is SF's are the least, are the most underrepresented on the executive level. The SF's, only about 9% of people that fall on the SF um, are on the, in, in the executive leadership level. So this just goes to demonstrate that there are types, that there are leaders for each type. Um, so you have President Obama and Einstein on the TP side, and you have Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King on the FJ side. And then Hillary and uh, Mark Zuckerberg, TJs, and FPs, uh, President Clinton and Steinberg, uh, Spiel Spielberg. So I deliberately left out President Trump because I think <laughs> together we can all guess what his type is. So what do you think, E or an I? E, correct. T or T, uh, uh, N intuitive or S sensing? <laughs> Any S's? Yeah, he's an E, E, S, S concrete, looking at things, at the facts, not so much worried about the future, acting in the moment, right? If you think about some of the things that have transpired. What about T and thinking, feeling? President Trump we're talking about? <laughs> but how does he make decisions? It's a tease on the thinking side. Decisions that he makes, does he step into it to consider what, how it affects other people? No. Hi. So, yeah. So on the, I think the last one you, you'll get, is it P or is it uh, J? P, right. Leaves all uh, things open till the end. So typically he's an ET, um, what is E, S, T, 
I have a sheet here with the la last piece of the handout because we don't really have time to delve further into any of this. It, but it does tell you the different types, the TJs being the logical decision makers, and I'll hand those out. It tells you what, the, what they bring to the table as a leader. The TPs are considered adaptable problem solvers. It tells you what they bring to the table. FPs are considered the supportive coaches and how they lead. And FJs are value-based decision makers. So I have those handout here. And on the back, it actually gives you a profile of each one of the types. Based on our uh, discussion today, did everybody come up with the type that they think they fall into? All right. Now, in order to verify that type and to determine your best fit type, you should take the assessment, the true MBTI assessment, and then verify the results. OK? So I'll, if somebody could start handing those out. I thank you for your time. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We just want to take one moment and give our presenter a hand clap for an outstanding guy. Is this an outstanding guy? Thank you. We just wanted to present you with a plaque. That oh, how nice. Very nice. Thank so, you very much. Thank you very much. So next we will be moving to the atrium in the alumni hall for lunch.